I'd like to welcome everybody to the February 24th Public Safety Committee meeting. Kelly, can we have roll call, please? Alderman Lockmiller. Here. Alderwoman Ebling. Here. Alderman Plufka. It's not present. Alderwoman Sims. Here. Okay. Move on to uh, the approval of the agenda. If we get approved by acclamation, anyone, uh, everybody in favor of acclamation, say aye. 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 Anyone oppose? So it shall be. Kelly, anybody out there? We do not have any members um, raising their hand. No citizen comments. All right. On to the city administrator report. Bull, I believe you have something. Uh, yes, I think uh, right before the meeting started, I heard congratulations going all around. And uh, more formally, I just wanted to announce um, that at the February 16th Board of Aldermen meeting in closed session, the mayor appointed uh, Ronnie Cottrell as the new chief of the Brentwood Fire Department with unanimous support by the Board of Aldermen. And so that became effective uh, Monday, February 22nd. So once again, congratulations to Ronnie, our new fire chief. Um, and, you know, well wishes have been coming in all day. So um, if members of the committee would like to formally chime in um, and then maybe have Ronnie say a few words. And at the same time, we are wishing Chief Curtin well and thanking him for his uh, 10 years of service with the city of Brentwood and 40 plus years of, of fire service in the St. Louis region. So thank you to both gentlemen. Thank you very much. All right. Well then let's use the reports of committee chair and alderman to go ahead and do that. I'll start out, Ronnie, or I should say Chief Patrell, we look forward to working with you and I know the members of the committee too. Congratulations on your appointment. Thank you very much. And Chief Curtin, you can't get away without a few words. Um, <laughs> I, rem I remember when I first got on the board, it was uh, you as assistant and Ted uh, Jury as the chief. And about a year or so in, Ted, you know, announced that uh, he was going to be leaving. And I thought, wow, there's some big fire boots somebody's got to fill there. And you came and filled that, those boots and then some. Um, you know, I always like when Bola put out the proposed budget. And the first thing I would do is go to your capital improvement budget and see what type of equipment you wanted for the year. And, you know, everything from uh, ballistic vest to the flare to speedboat or the, uh, the rapid water recovery boat, the ambulance, all that equipment was well priced and it was always to make your guys safe and to better serve the community. And along those lines was the training you always uh, put your guys through. I, it was like as soon as we had bought a building, a city property, you were down there lighting it on fire or knocking a hole in the wall taking the guys through and giving them the proper training to serve the community. I remember one day I'm driving down Manchester Road and there's a bus sticking out of the side of the building. And I'm thinking maybe I missed a, 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 a code red call on the uh, zombie apocalypse or something. I, and it was all about the training and it was about even training the mutual, the municipalities surrounding in the mutual aid. And I think once again, that was to serve you know, make the guys safe and to serve our community. Um, community outreach, uh, you know, you always invited the citizens into the firehouse for different events and you reached out to the community with different charitable events and even won the, uh, this year, the um, Citizen Volunteer Award for the department from the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Also, the first female firefighter. I think that may be the history of Brentwood to have our first female firefighter that we uh, elected. And at the same time you're doing all this, you're having to do something that a chief really shouldn't have to do, and that's make a firehouse habitable and accessible. I mean, you took on the problems we were having with mold remediation, sewage, and making the thing ADA accessible, and we thank you for that. Um, and Delaire, another 
dumpster fire on top of that, you had to deal with a pandemic. Uh, your retirement is greatly, we really appreciate the time you've put in here and uh, your retirement is definitely deserved. And I, I wish you the best with you know the rest of your life with your wife, your family and your friends. Thank you, Chief. Well, I, I, I don't know whether I should respond to that now or wait for everybody to finish, but I, <laughs> I think I feel the need to just say this and this is all encompassing and I apologize if I start to get a little emotional. It's, it's been a hell of a career. I've really enjoyed it. I never expected the opportunity to be the fire chief for the city of Brentwood. I came in with Ted expecting that the two of us would hang around for at least 10 years and, and I would support him any way I could. And when he decided to move on and uh, drop that bomb, I about had a heart attack and, and just embraced it. And um, I've always heard people that are good leaders and successful uh, in business that surround themselves with good people. And um, I, I leaned on that heavily. Uh, first of all, uh, to thank the elected officials in Brentwood for their support when we need to bring staff in because of a retirement or an injury or an unexpected accident, whatever. Um, you guys are always there to let us fill those roles. Um, the firefighters and paramedics in Brentwood are second to none. And um, they're a huge part of the success of my five years as chief in that department. Um, I would be completely remiss. And if I didn't mention how much Ronnie means to me, not only as a friend, but as a, uh, an assistant chief, um, I am absolutely thrilled to death that the city chose to make him your next chief. I, I, he has been working his tail off to be prepared for this opportunity should it have come along and it has and the city did the right thing in my opinion. And um, I just cannot thank everybody that has um, made me look good every day uh, for what their part of that role, you, you know, in my under my leadership what their role was in that success. Um, everybody Bola has just been amazing to learn from and grow alongside of uh, with her leadership and experience over the years. And it, it, it's just a top-down successful organization. And I think it reflects every day when the residents need something, whether it's police, fire, public works, the job gets done and it gets done to the best of everybody's ability. And it's a tremendous team. And frankly, this is something I've heard from so many people over the years. You know, you're not gonna miss the, the, the nonsense and the stress and all of those things, but you're gonna miss the people. And that happened to me once when I left Ladue and um, it's gonna happen to me again when I leave Brentwood. But um, I just have the most sincere thanks in my heart for all of you that have supported me over the years and thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Alderman Plufka is away. Alderwoman Ebbing. Can I say yes. something? Okay. Oh, yes. Chief, <laughs> Chief Curtin from Brentwood Forest. We don't have a lot of fires, but we have a lot of falling old people, <laughs> and they all love the Brentwood Fire Department. Those people, you are all so kind and generous with people who are ill and fall down, which we have a lot of with our streets and so forth. And everybody just thinks you all do a wonderful job. So everybody here is happy. And I know we'll like the new chief because you trained him. Well, thank you very much, Alderwoman Ebling. It means a, a tremendous amount to me and uh, we're proud to do our job every day. And I hope it sounds like that shows all over the place, so thank you. Yes, it does. It really does. Thank you for your service. You're absolutely welcome. Alderwoman Sims. Thank you, Alderman Lockmiller. Uh, Chief Curtin, I certainly uh, echo the sentiment uh, that's been said by my fellow Alderman. You came on as Chief right about the same time when I came on as an Alderman. So uh, you, and I've been on the public safety committee from, from day one. So um, I've enjoyed working with you. I, you were professional. Uh, you displayed a, a extraordinary amount of expertise and 
uh, insight and, um, and compassion and uh, you'll be missed. Uh, and, and we are very grateful to, uh, to see the baton pass to uh, now Chief Contrell. Um, we're excited to have him uh, take the helm. You're leaving us in good hands. Uh, but you, the door's open uh, and, and thank you so much for your service. Thank you very much, Alderman Sims. I appreciate it. And um, again, it's just it's just been a tremendous ride, and I just can't thank everyone that's made it so successful enough. So, all right, thank you, Chief. All right, we'll move on to department reports. First up is the police department. Uh, we've got the pilot traffic enforcement program. Want to give us an update, Chief? Yes, sir. Um, we can start with the traffic report. Uh, Major Hawkins is here next to me, and uh, she will give you a briefing on the traffic. Thank you. We had a dedicated officer, as you guys know, for about three weeks to focus strictly on traffic enforcement. A lot of that came out of uh, an increase in citizen complaints about traffic violations, and uh, specifically within the neighborhoods as well. So. We are very short on manpower. What I did was I took from a full crew of five and I stripped off one of their officers um, while that crew went to midnights with four. I took their fifth officer and kept him on days for three weeks. And basically I gave him the list of locations around town that we received the most complaints and also directed him to some other locations, mainly our major thoroughfares so that he could focus on generally reducing speeding, et cetera, et cetera. And we saw some pretty great results from him. Of note, we've seen an increase in our traffic citation issuance this year as it is. And then you add him to the mix who was doing strictly traffic enforcement uh, Monday through Friday for three weeks. And the, the numbers are, are quite impressive. The violations that we saw are very similar to violations of any review of this kind. You, you sit down, you look at, hey, what are we ticketing people for? And we saw a lot of registration violations and followed closely by speeding this time. And I think the speeding piece was where, where he really had an impact in terms of issuing citations. The probably largest benefit I see out of what we did with him was that we were able to deploy him in the areas where we had the complaints very specifically. And we didn't have to worry about trying to have an officer sit on a certain location for a certain number of hours without getting pulled away for calls for service or any other number of things that can get in the way of an officer's daily routine in that regard. Excuse me, in that regard. And that, that arguably was, was probably his, his biggest asset to the little pilot program that we did. And he himself did an excellent job. He's a, he's a pleasant young man with a good head on his shoulders and I'll tell you what, knock wood, I received zero phone calls from anyone who encountered him on the road uh, in terms of receiving a ticket from him. So he did a professional job, he did a thorough job, he met with community members and discussed their concerns with them. He, one of them, he went walking with her and her dog and her neighbor. And I think that did wonders for facilitating that relationship so they could at least see Here's the officer who's handling this for you. Here's the officer who's out here writing these tickets. And what are your concerns? What else do you want us to know about? And it was a really unique opportunity that he got to, to do that. So uh, by and large, it was, it was generally a success. I wish we could do that more often. I don't, um, I don't know if we could sustain that with other crews doing something similar. Some of our crews are low right now because of people who are out injured and, and a vacancy that we have. But um, it, it was a very productive three weeks, certainly. So um, any questions on that specifically? Or? Any questions from the committee? I've got just a couple. Um, I guess what the citizens are saying on Rosalie kind of bore out as far as some of the speeders that they see on there by the look at the looks of the ticketing that was done yeah it was very uh, beneficial for us to have someone that was dedicated up there for a longer period of time just to be able to see finally what 
the radar has told us and what the citizens have told us, and not only to be able to see it, but to immediately address it. And in addition to issuing citations for a lot of the speeders, as you saw, we were able to find out patterns of, of groups of people in certain areas. So Alex would notify me and say, hey, I've been stopping a lot of people that work for this company. And we were able then to turn around on the back end and reach out to the company and say, hey, you know, we've been getting complaints and a huge percentage of our violators are your employees. Can you put out a company-wide message asking the people to slow down, obey the speed limit, maybe use a different route? And that happened with two or three groups of people all throughout the city in varying locations of complaint. And it was a really neat way to identify who the problem was and address it from another angle, just besides handing out tickets. No, it looks like he learned a lot about you know, the, the driving habits of people, our residents, as well as people that work in the city and pa or pass through for that matter. Absolutely. Um, do you know any idea what the cost of doing this pilot program was? I guess that was mainly just overtime, but. We, we pulled him from his regular shift and had him do this full time. So this was his, we put oh. him on basically eight hours, um, eight hour days, five days a week. And that was just his working shift. So it wasn't, um, he did overtime on his own, but it was maybe an hour here, hour there, and nothing in excess of that for this program. Okay. And Chief, I guess there's, without hiring an, an actual traffic enforcement officer, there's no way to restructure the way, you know, we deploy our, our officers during the day, uh, you know, I. This almost looked, I mean, I, they're off, the citizens seem to like seeing the officers driving around, but this being a stationary officer and being able to even more directly interact with the citizens seemed to be more of a benefit than seeing them visually drive by in a, in a patrol car. One of the challenges we have all of them on, on day watch is the calls for service. We, you know, our, our lines here of our calls for service are day watch calls. So, uh, you know, Oftentimes, especially if we have a crew that's short anyway. Um, so dedicating an officer to do this full time is really gonna be a challenge for us. Uh, we can, like Angie was able to pull Alex for three weeks, we can do it selectively, but to do it full time is really gonna be a challenge for us in terms of manpower. So um, I, I agree with you. I understand your, your perspective on it. Um, in a perfect world, we would have somebody doing traffic that can do this on a full time basis. Um, I, I will say though that to give a shout out to Dan Gummershiner that one of the messages we gave Alex to, to as he talked with the citizens was to make them understand or help them to understand that policing this, these, the um, streets of Burnwood and doing traffic enforcement really isn't the most effective way to, to control speed. It, it's really a holistic program that's, that Dan's done a good job supporting, whether it's, you know, his setting up his stop signs in a particular way or whatever he has uh, done. So it has to be a whole package, so to speak. And I think the people, educating the people on that is an important piece of this as well. Because generally speaking, as soon as the police officers stop running radar and stop doing traffic enforcement in an area, people know it. And then the, the, once you let your foot off of that, then it comes right back typically. Uh, short of having somebody on a particular street or area every day, writing tickets every day, and you get the reputation of being speed trap. Short of that, it typically will go away, that, that effect. So um, it, it's something that we can discuss moving forward. Uh, I've talked to Bolo about this a couple times in the last couple of weeks. Um, pulling an officer like we did with Alex for, for a couple of weeks to do this um, is doable. We can do that. It's just, it kind of depends, you know, and then there's an ebb and flow with vacations and people being off. We've got two people still on sick leave right now that had substantial injuries off duty. So there's, there's all kinds of variables here that affect the ability to be able to do this permanently. Well, I pre appreciate the effort and, you know, I know Alderman Plufka would like probably to go over this, but he can't, couldn't be here tonight. Maybe we'll take this up again at another meeting. Um, and, uh, no table it for now, but I'm glad I escaped Alex's wrath 
and uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he was out there. He was looking. We'll definitely take this up at a future meeting. Okay. Okay. I was going to go go on if uh, we're ready. I was going to cover some uh, incidents on the crime report at this point. Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Well, there's a couple of things of note that happened in the last couple of weeks. I wanted to touch base on. Uh, we've had two incidents. One occurred on February 8th. The other, um, <clears throat> excuse me, occurred on February 21st. Both of them involved people that came into Brentwood, uh, whose history were. They were, they're chronic panhandlers, they're people with drug problems, they have mental illness. And they wandered into the Brentwood area at night and decided that they were gonna knock on doors and cause a lot of consternation amongst our, our folks in Brentwood, and for good reason. Uh, I think it's important to note, however, that, that these two guys that were, and, and they were arrested by our officers after this happened, both incidents, different guys. Um, neither of them were, what I would call uh, people that were intentionally doing violent crime. Uh, these were guys that were knocking on doors, really either looking for help, so to speak, or they were looking for money, and, and or both. Uh, really what they did was they knocked on doors and aggressively begged from people here, and when they didn't get a response, they would go to the next door, knock on the door, and do it again. In one incident, on the second incident, the guy was even more aggressive, and actually tried to step into the house and, and really cause some, uh, and rightfully so, cause concern with the person that this happened to. So, but again, these are these are guys that are dealing with mental health issues and, and drugs, not necessarily what we would consider a, a home invasion or a armed robbery in progress, things like that. Neither one of them were armed. Uh, one tried to get in somebody's car, uh, and it came out and was reported as a carjacking initially. That wasn't the case, carjacking or a violent crime incident, and that's not what this was. So they're both very uh, concerning for us, obviously. Uh, Metro Link's a piece of this puzzle, and one guy in particular, he'd been arrested multiple times for Metro Link, failing to pay fares and things like that. Uh, so he's coming into the, to the area, he's in Metro Link and doing what he does here in Brentwood. So um, collectively, I'd like to speak briefly to the fact that these are real challenges for us not only for getting these kind of guys in custody safely, uh, they are a real challenge in today's world in law enforcement to try and make sure that we manage them well and get them in handcuffs and get them help or get them to a, a holdover safely. Um, but really on the back side of this, the, the biggest challenge is the lack of services for the homeless, lack of services for the mentally ill, lack of services for those that are addicted. Obviously, police departments in the area don't do that. That's not what we do. Um, but we certainly need those services to be able to successfully make our way through incidences like these two in Brentwood and many, many others that Terry's folks and now Ronnie's folks help us deal with on a daily basis. So it, it could be a panhandling call uh, for people begging for money, and it could be something more, much more uh, severe like these two guys. But it all is wrapped into this mental health crisis uh, that, that law enforcement deals with that uh, sometimes ends really badly in our world. So our officers receive a lot of training behind this. Our officer safety training emphasizes our, the tools that we give. We just put all, all of the cars now in Brentwood are equipped with less than lethal uh, shotgun options for our, our officers for if these things go that far south. Uh, and all, all of that's built around trying to de-escalate the situation, get it under control as safely as we can for our officers, but also for the people we're dealing with. So um, we train for this and we try to manage as best we can, but quite frankly, it can be a real challenge when you get the right person who's having these kind of issues and if drugs are involved or alcohol is involved, and uh, sometimes it isn't real pretty getting them control. I'll just put it that way, despite the training, despite what we teach. So, uh, this becomes a real challenge for us in law enforcement. Um, anybody have any questions relative to that? Because this came up recently with the mayor and others. Does anybody have any questions regarding that? So I guess it's just a revolving door then. I... To a large degree it is. As a matter of fact, it, you know, and we understand it. Uh, the only warrants issued out of the case from the other night are trespassing and, and potentially an attempt theft for auto theft. And, and quite frankly, those cases, they're not gonna lock this guy down. He's gonna get out quickly. 
So the first guy that we talked about on February 8th, he went to a review, a 96-hour review, because he was having a mental health crisis. But I would, I would bet my next paycheck he's out on the street now, too. So they just don't keep these folks. They, they don't have a place to take them outside of that review. Even if the 96-hour review says he's schizophrenic or he's in crisis, well, that's, that's fine. But what are we going to do with them? Most of them don't have families to take care of them. Most, most of them don't have, you know, they're homeless often. And they want to be homeless, and that's a piece people don't understand. They often say, well, take them to a shelter. Well, there's many, many of these folks as part of their mental illness. They don't want to be locked up anywhere. They, they, they enjoy that freedom of being out running the streets. So, uh, again, more challenges for us. But, no, the short answer to your question is no, both of them are out already. So there is no... Uh, from a criminal justice perspective, there is no uh, hammer on that backside to these folks. Thanks, Chief. We had a, uh, speaking of a violent crime, we did have one that I want to speak to, uh, a carjacking that occurred on February 9th at 8199 uh, Manchester, which is our Shell station. A woman showed up. She lives in the city. She came here to pick up her son, who was an employee there at the Shell station. And two guys in a vehicle that had been carjacked the night before in the city of St. Louis pulled a lot. They flourished a gun at her. Luckily, the son who come, came out to try and help his mom was not injured, and they ended up taking the cars. Take, they took her car, and they left in the car they arrived in, and it, it had been carjacked already. Those cars, both of them went north on Brentwood from the Shell Station from Manchester, and Officers from all of these cities around us jumped both cars and got into pursuit. Those cars went up 170 and split, one went east, one went west. The one that went west was eventually captured out in Maryland Heights. Uh, after his car was spiked and the foot pursuit occurred, they recovered the weapon, they got the car, and they got him. So there's a series of, of charges on this guy that uh, are pending now. Interesting and of note, I think, is the fact that he had been involved about three months prior in a very, very similar incident, and he was out on bond, a $500 cash bond. So that tells you a little bit about what our challenges are in terms of, and this is a the prior incident was an assault first degree with a weapon. So again, to your earlier question, all of the mock me were about what, <laughs> what's going on on the backside of these kind of cases. This guy is out three months later. Who knows what he did in the interim when he was out anyway, but in this case, he's caught again doing a very similar crime. So, uh, again, that these car-related uh, crimes, all of you probably may have seen in the news recently, St. Charles County and the emphasis that, that they're doing on that side of the bridge with this nighttime car initiative that they're doing. Unfortunately, it's all great stuff. They've locked up, I think, 26 people in the first couple of weeks all nighttime car crime. That's wonderful for St. Charles County, but <laughs> these guys are gonna quickly realize what's going on out there and they will come back on our side of the water to do this again. So we are looking at the spring and summer as the weather warms up, the proximity that we have to the city in East St. Louis, North County, which is the lion's share of where these suspects are coming from. Um, we are really gonna be challenged, I think, in, as the weather warms up with this kind of crime here in Brentwood. And, so, but we will address it as we go. Steve, can uh, you speak a little to the, some of the initiatives you've um, taken on with some of our mutual aid uh, municipalities, at least the discussion that, you know, you're- Yeah, I, I'll speak to it, Bullet. It's, um, so I approached Bullet about a month ago, or roughly about a month ago, and Angie and I have been talking about this for quite some time. And by the way, our nighttime crime has reduced in the winter, so we're, Compared to St. Charles, Jeff County, and some other areas, uh, we are down in nighttime crime, so, uh, which has been a blessing through the winter for us. But we, we know it's coming back, especially in St. Charles County and Jeffco, as I mentioned, are, are pressing hard. They're locking these guys up. Their prosecutors are on board. Their judges are on board. So those two areas are, are changing their tactics in terms of how they're dealing with these guys that are doing this kind of crime. Uh, they're seeing multiple weapons being seized out of their arrest, which we, we all know, and I keep preaching on the fact that these guys are extremely dangerous. So Angie and I have reached out to the ECDC chiefs, and we're in discussions with those uh, other municipalities to form a task force as we move into the warmer weather. And I, I, 
I have not brought this to you as a committee at this point because we internally with the chiefs have not reached a decision whether or not we're even going to, we, we even want to do it before we bring it to you as the elected officials. The reason for that is it's, it's a volatile thing to do. Uh, it involves changing, adjusting the pursuit policy to a degree because there's absolutely no reason to do this and then spike a car and just let it go. Um, so in effect, what we'd be doing is adjusting our pursuit policy to allow officers to chase the cars that run from a spiking incident if that's where we go with this. That's what St. Charles County's doing, that's what Jeff Coe's doing. There's several municipalities around us, without naming who it is, that have also done this style of, of nighttime enforcement and adjusted their rules with their officers. And so, there, you know, there's, it's a complicated thing to do in my mind because it's so volatile. And people think, well, you're gonna spike a car and the car tires go down and the guys give up and then, you know, all is well. Well, that, that's, that's not always the case. Uh, just to give you a quick example, last night in St. Charles, they spiked a car at the river, at the river going into St. Charles, from St. Charles County and St. Louis County. And it didn't come to a stop until it hit bus floors on Highway 70 in the city. So, you know, again, and that doesn't mean that the guys in the car are necessarily going to just raise their hands and give up. Sometimes they do. Oftentimes they bail out of the car and run. Oftentimes they're bailing out of the car and running with weapons in their hands. And you can imagine the, the danger that puts our officers in, but you can also imagine that we may end up in a, a violent confrontation at the end of that. That's, that's, that's where you're headed when you do this kind of stuff. All of that is weighed against, and what Bo and I have really discussed is what is our job in law enforcement to protect the city's people here in Brentwood from this kind of crime, which is very, very dangerous crime. We've got video after video that we've shared with you guys and pictures of ring videos of these guys moving as little units in our streets, well-armed, actually pointing guns at people's houses. And this is not an isolated, this, this, is going, this has been going on for oh, two, three years at least now. They've become very bold, they're very well-armed, uh, and they move as a group, and they're a real challenge for us in law enforcement because when they see the police, they just run, and they flee at exceedingly high speeds as, as we're going through this now. So. Having said that, uh, for us here in Brentwood, if Clayton, Richmond Heights, Maplewood, and, and us and others got involved in the task force, they typically go Highway 64 East or Highway 170 North. Just like St. Charles County is sitting on their bridges coming back in, we would sit on those two highways with spike teams if we did this. If we do that, there's a very good chance we're going to spike a lot of these cars. And then from there, we will... <laughs> The task force is going to be challenged with following the car and trying to take these guys into custody as safely as we can. So, uh, we are at the, the point to, to uh, address what Bola asked me to tell you. We are at the point where we were in discuss. We are in discussions with the chiefs, and at that point, uh, once we get a first blush, like I did with Bola with the city administrator's office here, to get a temperature and a feel for what everybody thinks, we would present that uh, collectively to you as elected officials and say, hey, this is what we recommend. This is what we think will work. We know it'll work because we did it. We did some of this in June when all the, the protests and rioting and, and horrible things were going on all over our city. Uh, we absolutely know that it will work, but we will be 100% honest with you and tell you it is a dangerous thing to do, not only for our officers, but uh, just generally speaking. It's a work in progress. Do you think the efforts you guys with the surrounding municipalities, municipalities have done so far has been to push what St. Charles is now experiencing and areas Fenton further out? Yes. Uh, Eureka, <laughs> which I was, my family was terrorized by these guys about two months ago. Uh, yeah, it, absolutely. It's, um, it has pushed that out. I will tell you the further out that these guys go, the more they run into people that won't understand that they can't leave their keys in their car, uh, leave their cars open, leave their nine millimeter under their seat, leave their purse in the front seat. The further out they were going, the, the more they were seeing a target rich environment in that regard. So, uh, you know, Ledoux, all of us in these, in these areas, as we got hit, we were putting signs up to our citizens, please lock your cars, please, you know, don't do things in your cars. I think that messaging piece worked 
that was piece, a piece of why they went. They started stretching and going out further, uh, and they were successful. And every time they got jumped, just like here it happens in Brooklyn, we have multiple, multiple times where one of our officers at four in the morning in Brentwood Forest happened last, last night. night. Uh, one of our officers in Brentwood Forest last night tried to stop a car three thirty, whatever it was in the morning, and the guy didn't stop. They were in there going, going to break into cars and go through cars and steal cars. Um, you know, and they hit the highway at 120 miles an hour. We let them go. A lot of that going on here in Brentwood, Richmond Heights, and Clayton. Uh, I, I call it the, you know, you run to the border and get them out of town. It, it's not effective. It, that Part of that is just their game. Part of that is entertaining to them. <laughs> it's part of the reason they're doing what they're doing. Is it, I think to, they think they're on a video game at some point, except they often have a, an extended magazine weapon in the seat with them. So um, it, it, these guys couldn't be more dangerous to our citizens, in my opinion, if they're doing this for 40 years. I can tell you I've done a lot of things in my career. These are the most dangerous guys I've seen running consistently. Uh, they are trapped, or if you come out and challenge them in your driveway, they are, they are very capable of hurting people. So that's what we're weighing here when we come at you guys as elected officials, fully aware of what, uh, what the risks are. And that's just, there's really no other way of putting it. I mean, it's, this, isn't a, this isn't a thing that we take lightly in any way. You know, it's it's a risk for our officers. It's a it's a potential risk for people on the street. Even though we'd be doing it at night when you have very little traffic out, um, but you know, there, there's a very strong argument that doing this, we're going to protect people. We're going to limit, just like St. Charles County and Jeff Co are doing. You will see that slow down in their communities. It's going to they they will suppress this kind of activity. We already have a prosecutor on board. Uh, Wesley Bell's office called me yesterday. They will, if we do this, assign a county prosecutor to any car-related crime that we come up with as a task force, which was pretty, uh, that was a significant step. Uh, and on a final note, because I know this is going kind of long, but on a final note, there is a felony fleeing law in the state of Missouri that's been in place for years, meaning that if you flee from any uh, legitimate police traffic stop, it is an automatic felony. The driver is committing a felony. So we would key off of that charge in this task force because that is a rock solid felony charge on the driver. Uh, and if we get them in a stolen car, we get them in a carjack vehicle, we get them with weapons, we get them with other charges, that's great. But we have a solid felony on the driver in these circumstances. So uh, in Wesley Bell's office, uh, through Tim Swope have told us they will issue that felony fleeing charge on the driver in these cases. That's a big step forward for us as we look at these cases. So that's a, that commitment's already there. The last thing I was going to mention, uh, all of them was um, just briefly I wanted to kind of, uh, touch on the contract patrol piece. Um, when I got here in almost three years ago now, we initiated a, a requirement for our officers out of seven neighborhoods. We split the city into seven neighborhoods. I think all of you are aware of this. And as the officers did their rides in, the, in those neighborhoods, they would call out on a contract of patrol from neighborhood to neighborhood. The reason I did that was it's just a, another accounting tool for us to be able to assure they were in those neighborhoods if we directed them. And we were able to go back to you as the elected officials to assure that all of you could see and feel that our officers were doing what we expected of them, and that was right the entire town through their shifts. We, we hammered on the ECDC management staff to make sure that we will not be in charge because charge, ECDC charges by call for service. Mm -hmm. There are a select group of calls they don't charge for, and they even sent us a list that clearly stated contract patrols were not going to be charged. It says it on the list, I have it. It's checked as being one of the, the calls for service that they weren't charging cities for. In January of this year, there was some discussion that came our way that they were going to start charging for it. That other, that, that there were reasons behind it while the other cities thought perhaps we should charge for that. So we quit doing it. And I, it, it wasn't an officer safety issue. It wasn't a performance issue. It was any, but, uh, we have the GPS that back the, our ability to be able to, to show where the officers were and how they were riding the streets. So it became 
um, less important, I guess you would say. It wasn't it needed so strongly, and it certainly wasn't worth the charge that ECDC was going to charge us for it, because there were thousands of these call-outs. So we stopped it in January. Um, and Bola being on the, I believe she's the chair of the ECDC um, folks. Bola, did you have anything you wanted to add to any of that? Well, when we looked at the number of um, control, what is it, contract patrol calls, um, the member cities of ECDC, um, not including us, had about a total of maybe 10 or 12 contract patrol calls for service. Brentwood had about 25,000. And that is such a significant number that we've started the conversation about what are the calls for service that should um, result in how we calculate the member cost. Um, changing rules midstream is, is not something I'm gonna be happy with or accepting on behalf of the city and I've conveyed that to the member, members of the board of directors. So we're, and we're gonna be having that conversation going into the 21-22 uh, budget uh, process for ECDC. If we were to allow the related cost of that to be put in next year's budget, it would lead to about a $35,000 increase in the membership cost that Brentwood would have to pay. So it, it is an ongoing discussion. It's an ongoing conversation. And I'm happy that Chief Speed uh, was agreeable. It was his decision. It wasn't mine. I just wanted to make him aware of what was going on. And um, the day we had that conversation was when he stopped it. So um, we're just sharing this information. Um, conversation's still progressing so that you know. Okay. That's all I had, sir. Any questions for the chief? Seeing none. Thanks, chief. Yes, sir. Thanks, Major Hawkins. Thank you. Move on to fire department. Chief Cottrell, I believe, or are we still working with Chief Curry? So Alderman Lockmiller, this is Terry. Um, we're gonna tag team this report a little bit, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I'm gonna start off with just an update and try to finish up a couple things that I started and then I'm gonna hand it off to Ronnie, okay? Sounds good. So um, just, we're in a good place right now with COVID. Um, we are stable. We still only have one employee that's affected. We have had no new cases in several weeks. I'm knocking on wood as we speak. Um, we had a, uh, excuse me, an unusual incident recently on the 7th of February at the MSD site down on suburban tracks directly across from Brentwood Plastics. Um, our crews got called by one of the Brentwood police officers who noticed a uh, fire in a uh, light tower type generator. Um, our guys got down there and it was in fact burning and it had um, radiated heat onto a uh, Connex type container and, and started some fire inside of that and melted a, a porta potty. Guys got the fire out right away with a minimal amount of water, but it was unusual um, in the sense that uh, these things just don't generally happen like that. Um, I, there was nothing that led to any suspicious activity when the police officer arrived, the gates were closed uh, and, and secured shut. So I don't think there was anything that indicated anything like that. It was just kind of unusual. After talking with the company, they indicated it was a brand new unit. Um, so they leave it running after hours to charge batteries in that Connex container for the next day. So uh, there was an awful lot of electrical cords running off of it. I don't know whether it had a malfunction or not. Um, but anyway, that was kind of an unusual fire. Um, we've had uh, three fires since the beginning of the year, and that's another one that uh, we're still working on loss values on. Um, the other thing that's of notice is we've been running a lot of uh, frozen pipe calls, uh, especially in the industrial park and some of the bigger buildings with sprinkler systems in them in town. Um, I, I was surprised when I wrote this, um, I anticipated a lot of calls this week as the weather warmed up. So unless, unless I'm completely about to be duped on this, it's been pretty quiet and I don't want to really say a lot more. The guys were very, very good about working with the uh, building owners and whatnot to squeegee water out where they could. And um, so it was very busy on them during that cold spell. 
Shifting gears to personnel, um, one of our newest employees um, tendered his resignation with me a couple of weeks back um, and is going back to his original employer that we hired him from. Um, and uh, he, uh, you know, was very thankful for the opportunity, but I guess they were, uh, they, they made him an offer he couldn't refuse. So we are working with a candidate off that current hiring list that he was hired off of. Um, and so that's in the process as we speak, so we can get a body back in quickly. Of course, you guys know about my plans. Um, I wanna jump into this EMS billing thing that I brought up to you last month. I've got some follow-up information. As you recall, we learned in December that uh, Anthem, part of Anthem Insurance, not their entire company is reimbursing their residents directly for EMS service um, expenses that their policies cover. Um, we found this out through our billing company and we are trying to um, go after and, and recoup those funds that we would have normally collected from the insurance company on behalf of their clients. Um, and we're trying, we, we brought this forward to you guys. We believe our policy indicates that we have the latitude to do that. Um, and everybody on the board seemed supportive last month, although there was a question raised by Alderman Plufka about billing our residents specifically the amount of money that their insurance company pays them. So if they were billed a thousand bucks and their benefit only covers 500, Alderman Plufka's concern was that they only receive a bill for 500. And so we've worked that out with the billing company. They are able to do that. One of the things that I was originally told was that they thought they maybe could include a copy of the patient's uh, explanation of benefits or EOB with that bill. But unfortunately, the way they receive those in a large bulk form from all the insurance companies, it's not possible. So um, if, the, if the committee is open to this consideration, um, I'd like to move forward with getting this in place. Keep in mind, we had 18 of these last year in 2020. Um, when I talked to our folks early this year in January, we only had one to date. So I don't know how many of these we're gonna see on a normal non-COVID year, but um, I'd like to give the authorization to the insurance company to proceed with billing. Um, I work with Janet and Susan, and we're going to create a, another um, uh, information tab on the Brentwood Fire Department website page that, I, that explains this in more detail and shows examples of the invoices uh, that the customer, that the resident would receive. So there will be an education piece on that as well. Um, so I guess the, the, I'd, I'd like to find out if the committee has an appetite uh, to allow us to start doing this. Anybody have any input for the chief? I, you know, I, I can't remember Dave's exact concerns. You know, I kind of wish he was here. Um, is this something we need to do right now or? It's not, and we can wait. Um, that's, that's not a problem. Um, you know, I, at this stage of the game, um, we waited and, and that's okay. I, I, I don't see any issue that we absolutely have to do this tonight. So if you would feel more comfortable with that, I think that's okay. Yeah, I'd like to have him be able to chime in. So okay. if we could put this off to March and uh, Ronnie can take it up and we'll be absolutely. happy to okay. accommodate your wishes. Yeah. Very good. So then I'm going to move on. Um, we have an item on, uh, on, on our update for um, an approval tonight. Um, in the 2021 budget, we requested $125,000 as part of the capital fund to replace turnout gear for our folks. Um, that's coat, helmet, boots, gloves, pants, etc. We have an opportunity to purchase from a 2016 contract that we bought our last set from uh, using the Metro West Fire Protection District contract that you all approved in 2016. Um, that contract doesn't expire till July. And there's a couple of reasons that we wanna do this. One, we benefit from a major purchase of over 100 sets of turnout gear. So we're getting pricing on almost 133 sets of gear instead of just 23 and um, it's 2016 prices with the built-in increases that they're allowed by the contract and it's 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 still significantly cheaper than if we went out for bid again this calendar year so 
um, I would ask the committee's approval to approve us placing an order um, through the Metro West contract for um, 23 sets of coats and pants for our folks. And then Chief Cottrell will, br will be bringing the balance of that gear forward as he's had an opportunity to either bid it or find it on a purchasing contract. So there's more to come with this. This is just getting started. So um, if we could get a, uh, an approval to move this on to the full board for the 3-1 meeting on the consent agenda, and your support tonight, that would be great. So moved. Second. All right. Did you get that, Kelly? I did. Thank okay. You. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone oppose? All right. Chief will do that for the next board meeting. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to hand this off to Ronnie to finish out the rest of our update. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. So just uh, one more item to add to our department uh, report. We would like to put out an RFP um, to replace our ballistic vests that we currently have. Um, they have a five-year certification. And so we're, at, we're hitting that five-year mark uh, this summer on that, those vests. So we put the RFP out now, um, probably the end of May, we would be able to uh, bring something forward um, to present for purchase. Um, the lead time on this equipment is about 12 to 14 weeks. So we don't want this to lag uh, for too long. Ronnie, we've got that under new business. I need to I'm so sorry. No, that's fine. We'll definitely take it up. Uh, under new business. I'll be quiet. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Anybody have any questions for the fire department? All right, we'll hear back from Chief Patrol in a moment. We'll move on to Dan. Uh, you've got an update on a few things. Yeah, we'll just go back to back and then you can stop me whenever you got a question. Uh, the first one's pretty straightforward. Rosalie, I know we talked with, um, you know, we did the, the radar, uh, the data collector, you know, that uses a Doppler radar. And then from our last meeting, we talked about we have an extra radar enabled speed limit sign kind of like the one that you see on Pine, uh, Rosalie, McKnight, you know, we've got several of those deployed. So um, we called in locates in that 8700 block of Rosalie. So this is between Brentwood Boulevard and Swim Club. So we plan on putting the, putting the sign on the north side of Rosalie. Uh, that'll be out of the construction area since we're putting sidewalks on the south side. And then uh, we'll deploy that. It probably will be Friday. I know we don't have hardly any households. Uh, we've already called in locates. Looks like the location we pick should be fine. It'll be between the sidewalk and the curb in that tree lawn. So as you're heading westbound from Swim Club, that intersection towards Brentwood Boulevard, it'll flash your speed limit against the posted speed limit, which is 20 miles per hour. So we'll be able to record uh, real data for westbound traffic, see if that helps, You know, since we have a baseline of what it was before. Um, I can certainly run a report and bring it to the next meeting and see if that improved, you know, a certain percentage or volume. So that's pretty straightforward on that one. Uh, if there's no questions on that, I'll jump over to McKnight. Um, McKnight, um, City of Ladue, you know, we had several um, uh, criteria that they wanted to address before they would say yes or no to a speed cushion. Uh, their public works met, that was on February 3rd. Uh, they actually tabled doing anything until they had more information. So theirs is kind of strange. They meet um, every other month, they meet in even months. So the next time that the, that group will meet is on April the 7th of 2021. So between now and then what they're supposed to do is look at Pine Avenue and also look at their current codes Right now, they don't have a traffic calming program either, just to let you know. I gave them a copy of ours and some of the other neighboring cities that have them. I gave their public works director that information. So um, they're looking into it. I don't know 
if it completely unravels, my plan B in my mind was that we could use the money we would have spent for a speed cushion to possibly buy more of the speed limit signs. We do have one on McKnight. Maybe you would strategically place them elsewhere. Um, I don't know. One of the benefits I see with the signs is that we can give access to the police and they can see uh, what people are doing at least northbound in real time. So maybe there's certain times you would deploy an officer because that would be the sweet spot. You know, maybe it's between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. that there's more speeders going northbound. That's an option, but we'll at least let this play out and see what they say. Um, you know, their mayor, I know, had initially supported it, but I know it needs to go through their committee and their board to actually be approved. I did get a better price, not better in the sense that it's cheaper, but more refined. Um, so it's looking like it's closer to 8,500 for a complete set. The length actually increased. It went from seven feet, which is like out at Pine. We were thinking this would be 14, like double, but in reality, because it's a posted 30 mile per hour, they're thinking it should be 21 feet. In the interim, I'm going to reach out to another vendor of speed cushions to see if that is the case. Uh, if they have a different opinion, maybe they would have a different uh, dimension and maybe that would be cheaper. So I figure I'm going to keep looking at this and until it's completely you know, either approved or rejected. And then, like I said, my, my plan B would be, you know, if we, if we were going to commit, say it's 8,500 or $17,000 to this, you know, we can certainly buy the speed limit signs cheaper than that. You know, those are roughly 3,800 a piece. And it gives you the one year of the uh, cloud subscription too. And there's no limit on the number of users. I would be the admin and I could give, you know, eight officers access to it. It's not a big deal. So well, then it sounds like we're in a holding pattern and so uh, our, our April meeting. So, right. I just didn't want to do nothing with it. I thought, well, I, there's other things I can be doing in the background. And then that way you've got a little bit of a contingency plan in case things unravel. Yeah. I would just, you know, I wouldn't want to commit to buying anything yet, you know, okay. not for that, especially if they said no then I've got a solution that needs to go somewhere else or else I need to put it on a shelf and I don't want to just spend money to have something sit. Well, do you need any direction from us on this or can we hold? No, this was for informational purposes. And like I said, by the next meeting, you know, I'll have more information on pricing, but I still won't have a, a concrete direction from Ledoux unless they meet, you know, in between. I just know their routine is even months as public works. Yeah. Any questions for Dan on that? All right, Dan, keep going. Okay. And then the uh, streetlight project, that's one of the other fun things we've been working on. So uh, this pertains to York Village. So I included a map of where we were looking prior, like in the background uh, section of the memo. So 10 York Drive, 18 York Drive, 24 North Coat, 69 York, 54 York. Those are those orange polygons that are on the map. Uh, that was the initial um, discussion back at the end of December and then in January. Since the January meeting, uh, you know, we've met with some property owners. I've talked to the trustees. Uh, then the second map that I included in there, I've got confirmation 54 York said yes. Uh, then I've got uh, several rejections. So like 10 York said no. Then I looked at 14 York, they said no. I've looked at 69 York, which is, um, oh, that's about uh, maybe four houses south of 54 is 69. They said no. Then I jumped across the street from that property, the 38 Middlesex, they said no, so on and so forth. So what it boils down to is I've got 54 as a yes. And then I've got number 18 still in play. I sent an email to them today because they didn't flat out say no. They said, well, yeah, we're open to it. Can you give us more information like the product sheet? So I sent them the product sheet and I said, you know, if you want a, more information, I can call the vendor, but this is what it's going to look like. So hopefully 18 says yes. Then I've got the two in the islands on York Hills since I've had so many other rejections, that would be four. And then number nine hasn't gotten back to the trustees. If they do, fine. If not, my uh, my backup plan is just north of 24 North Coat, then that would be five. So if I can get those five locations ironed out this week, then the surveyors hopefully can go out next week, pick
pick up the easement information and then we can get these easements executed, recorded. We've already got the lights in stock. You know, as soon as the weather breaks and maintains a little normalcy, not uh, freezing last week and above normal this week, but as long as it's, uh, I'd say 50 degrees and up, we could pour concrete, you know, get the foundations in and uh, move forward. So I'm hopeful like we originally planned, you know, by April timeframe, the lights are up and, and functional. Any questions for Dan on this? Never seems to end. Um, Dan, you had mentioned possibly getting one up and when people see it, maybe it's a positive and maybe- I did speak with the trustees. Uh, they don't need to actually have residents vote on it. It would just be the trustees. So when, as soon as we get their um, easement signed off, I'm assuming that the trustees would sign off the easiest then we could go ahead call locates in and get those up. I'd like to get those up ahead of the other ones. You know, for our crews, we don't need to wait until all five are signed. We can just work them in with our normal work. So, so I kind of thought that way, if you got some up as a sample, then you're correct that, you know, maybe that would change some of the, the negatives to positives. Yeah. I think you got a good idea there. I, um, what's it take to get the trustees on board? Just, I'd need to give them the document. So whenever we get that doc, easement document that is uh, to them, then they'll sign it, the three of them, and then it can be recorded. It doesn't have to be recorded for us to move forward. It just needs to be signed. So those are the ones we're gonna focus in on first is getting those, have TWM do those first, and then 54, and then hopefully this uh, other one, this 18, hopefully we can get those two later. Any questions for Dan? On these street lights. Well, Dan, it looks like you've uh, you're starting to make a crack in that wall that you're beating your head on. So yeah, <laughs> keep, up the, keep up the good work. Yep, thanks. Um, move on to the consent agenda. Uh, could it looks like all we have is the minutes from la the June or I'm sorry the January 27th public safety meeting. Um, all in favor of approval of the consent agenda, say aye. Aye. Looks like everyone said aye. There's no opposed. Move on. We have no old business. We'll move on to the new business. Uh, Chief Cottrell, you've got the ballistic uh, vest purchase. Yeah. Um, first, my apologies, speaking out of order. No, um, right. I went over most of what I wanted to highlight. I, I would add to that that um, we do use this equipment beyond um, gun violence incidents, um, suicidal patients, domestic violence, um, assaults. So we have several um, requirements in our uh, department policy where our personnel do uh, wear this equipment and it gets used on a regular basis. So uh, we do ask for your support to put out this RFP. All right, I'd entertain a motion to go to an, I guess we need to forward this onto the full board, Bola. No, um, and the I, committee just, yeah, I think so. All right, motion to allow Chief Cottrell to go out for an RFP for ballistic vest purchase. Okay, I have a motion today. Looks oh. like we got to move, and I think Sonny seconded. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, Chief, put out your RFP. Uh, finally, any citizen comments? Kelly, anybody out there? Nobody with their hand raised. All right. Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> all right. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, anyone oppose? Of course not. All right. See you all later. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.